Hello, my name is Miranda Smith, Arts Education Coordinator at Abernathy Arts Center. Welcome to Virtually Creative, presented to you by Fulton County Arts and Culture. Today, we're gonna to be working on Nirakomi. Nirakomi is a process that uses colored clay. It's a traditional Japanese um, way to create. Most people will equate it to English or British agate wear. I think that the two are different only because agate wear, you have a randomness of pattern. No two will look the same. Whereas with Nirakomi, it is very specific in how you lay down your lines and how you are using it, whether it's in a mold or freehanding it, that gives you a very detailed pattern that winds up being a little bit more extravagant than agate wear. Let's get started. So today I have some colored clay that I've prepared. Um, usually you can look up online to see what percentage is going to give you the shade you want. Know that if you want it to be a really, really intense color, it has to be a higher um, count or in grammage of mason stains. That's how you get your colors. So today what I have is I have um, some layers that I've done. I've got a white, a light orange, a red, a burgundy, and a black and I've rolled out my slabs and I've sprayed in between each one so that they're nice and tacky and laid right on top of each other. And I've got my two slats so that I can measure. Some of the things I brought with me today, I have a hump mold, I have a slump mold. Hump molds allows us to drape the clay onto and then we kind of like lay in on a slump mold. So you can see that that's nice and even, and I'm just gonna lay it down. And I'm gonna keep going until I'm out. One right beside the other. You do wanna be careful when you are working with colored clays, only because if you, are the type where you want everything to be perfect, you might want to use gloves so that you don't have that much interaction with your hands, because you're gonna get some color onto areas that you don't want, but you can always scrape at the end, which is typically what I do. As I was saying, Narakomi is a traditional Japanese um, way of working with colored clay where you are um, layering your clay and creating patterns and then building from that point. Colored clays go back in history a very long, a long way. I mean, back to Rome, China, England. Everybody has a history of it. How we work with it has changed. And even Nirakomi, the name, is a more modern name than what this typically was called. If I can get one more out of here. I won't use this very top, but I may use that other element. Let me get rid of these slats. So with your hump mold, I typically like to wipe down, get a little bit of moisture on it. I'll clean it up a little bit. I'm gonna set it aside. I'm going to take these because I want to make sure that I get them joined before I put them on my mold. 
When it comes to these, you can cut them down how much ever you want. Um, it's always an interesting process to see what you come up with. Shimmy this out. When you are blending your layers together, you do want to make sure that you use a piece of uh, canvas. You do not want the canvas to be super thick um, because you need that saturation from the water. So I'm going to start with my long pieces first. I'm just gonna place one beside the other. And I'm trying to make sure that I keep that pattern nice and even. The beautiful thing about working this way is that if you're very detail oriented, you can come up with some really, really beautiful pieces. If you are not, and you easily get frustrated, agate wear may be your thing. That may be um, something that you can work with with your colored clay. And then that way you don't have to worry about it so much because there's such a beautiful randomness to the agate wear. Put one more. Just going to use my board to kind of tap on both sides because you want you want them to touch. You don't want to see any gaps. The excess, if I don't need it, I'm just going to cut it away. I have a needle tool, and so I'm just going to pick up what I don't need. I'm doing it on the other end, and I'm doing it at my highest point. And again, taking away what I don't need. Your excess, you can always save. You can actually save and treat it like it's agate wear and re-wedge it and actually throw it on the wheel. When working with clay, I try not to waste anything. I use everything. So if I'm not throwing it on the wheel to make a little cup or something to get rid of that excess, then I will be definitely using it another way. I'm going to spray my form. And I'm going to spray on top. You need that moisture. to make sure it's all sealed. And you'll know if your layers are not because they will pull apart if they have not bonded. The good thing about working with the canvas is we just pick up and flip over.
Now your design will pick up the texture from the canvas, but using a metal rib will actually get that out. I'm gonna flip one more time. And spray one more time. I'm gently lifting up and pulling from the canvas. I wish I could say that that stain stays because how cool would that be on a shirt or something? But when you wash your canvas, it just keeps getting lighter and lighter and just goes away. So I have two types of ribs. I have a small one and a larger one. They do the same thing, but sometimes uh, I always start with my smaller rib first. And you'll see there'll be some streaking, but as the piece dries, you can go over it with a metal loop tool and actually scrape your lines back clean. So don't worry about the smear that you see because you'll be able to go back and straighten up your lines. I'm going to take my mold. Gently lift and drape. And you can always reposition. It's not going to hurt anything. This is one of those processes that if you don't take your time with it and you kind of rush it, you can end up messing up a really pretty design. So I'm gonna cut away just a little bit of excess off the mold. I'm going to bring this edge over here to see if I can actually get it to line up. And if I can, then I'll be able to cover the space I have over here without disrupting the design too much. To get it closer to the body, I want to make sure that with a little bit of water on the rib, I'm going to start at the bottom and then work my way toward the top so I can make sure that my, my design number one is really getting pressed down. And number two, I'm compressing that clay at the same time. Whenever you're working with a mold, instead of using metal tools, which will scrape plaster up and actually put it into the piece, which you don't want, 
because it will swell and it can cause the piece to blow up. Use a wooden tool to clean up your edge and that'll allow you to get as close as you want. You can see on that side, I still got a little bit of work to do. I need to get that edge in. So now on this side, because I have that gap, I've got to make sure that I work that area really well because that's going to be the area that is going to want to pop back open once it dries. With the sponge, I wanna make sure I get the bottom edge of the mold. You don't wanna leave it jagged and try to work on it later. You wanna make sure that you smooth it out as much as you can while it's on the mold and that's less work for you to do later on. In any areas that I've missed, I can always go back in and fill while it's still on the mold, before it completely dries, I can still add. So that's always a plus. So I'm gonna let that dry. I just wanna show you with the slump mold. Popping this guy out. And I'm just going to go along that edge and clean it up. I'm gonna hit the edge up with a sponge. One thing you have to remember about Niracomi and Agate Wear is that the intensity of the color, you really don't get that saturation until it is fired to temperature. So what I've used today is a B-mix that's cone six. So this is a raw state. So these colors will get darker. So you have, these are examples of work that they haven't been fired yet, so everything's kind of pastel -y in nature in the colors. But if you look at that blue and you look at the stripe that's going down, it's going to intensify to this color. So that gives you some, some idea as to how much your colors will pop more once you've taken them up to temperature. So like I said, you can Take another slump mold and all of these excess pieces that you think you're not going to do anything with, you can take them and randomly, even if you tear them, it doesn't matter because the clay is really tacky. I can lay it in there however I want. Try to cover as much space as you can. One very easy way to get rid of your excess clay. And even if you say to yourself, well, that looks crazy, comes out really pretty because there's a randomness to it and you're not thinking about it so much. Right now, I'm just filling in any space that I can see.
And then with my serrated rib, I'm gonna go in and I'm just going to press down. The beautiful thing about working like this is I could leave that texture in there and get a really beautiful design. I don't have to mess with it. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to fuss with it at all. And then again, instead of a metal, I'm going to use a wooden tool and I'm just gonna get rid of my excess. And when this guy pops out, I have a little dish that has texture, it's gonna have color, and then all I'll have to do is apply just um, little feet if I want it to, or if I want it to just sit flat. I do see one area I'm gonna tack just a little bit right there. I've been teaching with clay for a very long time, so my rule is always recycle, reuse. If you are to the point where you're throwing away your clay, you gotta look at it from a different perspective. Because as long as it can break down, it can be reused. And that's always a beautiful thing. Even if it pops off, doesn't mean anything. You just go back in. What's wonderful about the plaster molds is that it really allows the clay to dry. And once it sucks all that moisture out, what will happen is you will have a little seam right along the edge. You'll see it start to pop. And that means it's ready to be pulled out of the mold. And then you can finish your edge however you see fit. If you notice on a couple of these, they have um, some rippling from a coil that I put on the edge. And so that'll be another mold. We'll let that guy dry. And the last thing that I wanna show you today is that if you do make um, little small bowls or plates and you If you do make little small plates, bowls like that, these are just texture mats. They're really wonderful to use. They don't cost that much, depending on where you go. You can get them at Michael's and Hobby Lobby. But if you take this guy and you say to yourself, you know what, I don't want it to sit flat. I want it to stand up just a little bit. Just give yourself a coil. does not have to be perfect. You do want the ends tapered just a little bit. And then rolling onto that texture mat and picking that texture up. Pinch off, go and do it on the other side. And taking that tapered end, I'm just gonna roll. And cut off and with just a little bit of water and I'm using my needle tool just to score I'm going to place down and then pick up that's going to leave me an impression that will tell me where my mark is and then I'm going to score get it nice and gunky the messier it is the better the connection and place down that's one little foot on the bottom of that. And you just do a couple of more, that'll give you three and then it's elevated. So you, and it, one other thing is, is really nice is that whatever color palette that you want to use, sometimes using a color that is not within your pattern can be a nice break for the eye. Well, thank you guys for joining me today. I hope you have a wonderful creative journey and this is Miranda signing off.